Well, hello, Heidi, and welcome to the Seasons of Mother series. Thank you. Oh, what an honor to be with you, Sandy. And I love your background. Look at the colors of those trees. Yeah, it is. Honestly, this is just bursting with color right now. It is my favorite time in Ontario. I mean, I do love summer. I do. I really do. But there's something about fall when it enters in. It's just this new life um, experience. I love it. Yes. Yes. Glad I get to join in that scenery with you. <laughs> yes. Oh, and I love it. I'm glad. So thank you so much for being. Actually, it's really you're in you're coming back because you did an original post that we're going to be talking about today um, called um, Our Voices, which is just beautiful and relevant. And I really wanted people to hear about it from your perspective today, not just in the reading of the blog, but hear from you and then eventually go back to the blog so they can read more detail about it. So I'm just going to introduce you today to everybody. Um, and so Heidi McLaughlin, um, you are for over two day, two decades, you have been teaching, mentoring and encouraging women to step up to the plate and embrace their highest calling. You help women discover that joy is freely available to all of us and found in unexpected places. You are a dynamic and powerful speaker and you're teaching to inspire life change and draw women into an intimate relationship with each other and with God. And you speak at different women's conferences and events and retreats across Canada and internationally. You have a variety of books, one of which here, uh, Fresh Joy, that is absolutely fantastic. I highly recommend this book. Um, this topic explores specifically that pain and joy can coexist. Um, joy is the currency of heaven, which I love that so much, the currency of heaven. Um, how joy is found in the dark, places, pain and joy, relationships, and practical creative ways, ways to grow. And you talk about a place at the end, S-T-O-P, to reflect and pray and more. Um, I highly recommend anyone to pick up this book and read and then pass along to others and to head to Heidi's website as well, which I will put into the blog post so that people can find you. Um, but maybe tell us a little bit more about you and what you've been up to in the past couple of years and maybe about your family a little bit. Oh, thank you, Sandy. <laughs> well, before COVID, as you know, we say, and then COVID happened, right? Mm, yes. <laughs> before mm -hmm. COVID, I was traveling and speaking all over Canada and the United States and beyond. And then mm. COVID came and actually it opened doors globally and I'm part of the Women Together team in Canada and now because of COVID we've reached uh, up to 52 countries in the world and That's now incredible. I'm a lot globally. I just did, uh, I was zoomed into a conference on Friday night to Mongolia. Really? That's incredible. Yes. Yeah. And uh, in November, I get to partner with women together as we speak in Colombia and South America. And so we, I do, uh, <clears throat> I help out with mentorship training online and leadership training. And so it's become more online. I'm still doing some in person, but not as much as I used to. Mm -hmm. And my family, I have a blended family of five children and 12 mm -hmm. grandchildren. We're very eclectic. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's okay. I think we all are. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, what it's just a great when we get together I don't have any children that live here in the city with me so that makes me travel and see them or they come here so right. I'm really blessed that way I just had my 15 year old granddaughter fly out and be with me for really? five days and we just oh. had this incredible time together wow. yes. you know what it's that one on one time that's so special because you just pack it all in uh, yeah. and it, it just loads of memories what a gift Oh, I know. I love it. Oh, yeah. I know. You must. And and yes, I, I totally agree with you. I would do the same thing. I would want to do that with my grandkids and pack it in <laughs> for sure. But I'm not at that stage yet. I'm getting there. Yeah. <laughs> <One day. laughs> but I'll take it slow, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. But your blog post on voices really mm -hmm. resonated with me and I know with other people because we listen to the wrong voices often and it consumes us. And I was recently at a conference and I was listening to a motivational speaker who talked about the fact that we don't, we listen to ourselves, we don't talk to ourselves and we let the voices, you know, hinder our potential growth. And so I love what you said here. You talk about how voices are all around us and uh, you openly talk about the impact of your voice in the early years of motherhood. You say a mother's voice has a profound impact on her children's lives. So my question is, how do we as moms navigate that in our lives and our homes today? 
I'll send it. <clears throat> that is such a good question. And I wish that someone had told me in my stages of motherhood, the power and the impact of voices. Mm. Our voices have the power to change someone's life. Our voices speak life or death mm. into people. I, mm. I, I did not know the power of voices when my children were little. I do now and I'm still learning, but mm. our voices and our sounds and our body language is so important. Mm. And when my children were younger, and I, I know there's many moms out there too, we get frustrated, we're tired. Absolutely. Oh, and then I remember just shouting at my children and telling them, do I have to pick up your coat at the back door one more time? And they could feel mm. my anger. Yeah. And now I look back and I, oh, I wish I would have had a different tone in my voice. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't have many regrets in life, but I do wish I could have replaced some of those motherhood years where I, my voice wasn't always kind and compassionate. And so I have learned from that. And so I'm different with my grandchildren, but you know, we need to help each other when we're raising we children, to yes. help each other, how powerful our voices are. Mm -hmm. They really are. And I think um, my sisters and I have talked about this endlessly over the years because we've been very blessed to have children um, all around the same age over the years. And we all have navigated listening to our own voices and having our kids say, mom, you know, you're angry or why yeah. are you so angry? And the memory of that. And of course, I completely agree with you. Definitely one of my regrets would be the way that I would have spoken to my kids or the tone. And, and you don't realize what you're doing sometimes. You're just kind of caught up in the emotion of the moment. So I think having this conversation is really important to tell women not to make them feel badly, but to remind them to be clothed with compassion as it talks about in Colossians 3 just to to be reminded of that and it's not a condemnation it's just a reminder to walk alongside of people right yeah and the first thing I think is understanding the power that our voices have yeah. and how yeah. with our words we're literally shaping our children's lives and you know later on I remember myself children saying to me mom you were so angry back there and I I don't remember being angry, but they remembered yeah. and it has, it has impacted their lives. Our voices literally shape their lives. Yeah. It's a big responsibility when you think about it like that. But at the same time, it's also a call for us as moms, whatever stage we're at, to just take that step back and not let our emotions rise and just be, okay, you know what? I'm just going to take a deep breath. And if you need to walk away, you just need to walk away. Yeah. And how would you want to be spoken to? It's almost like, you know, you treat others how you want to be treated. But again, there's that moment in motherhood, as you said, you're tired yes. and exhausted and you're, you're just trying to get your, your bearings, <laughs> get on your feet in the morning. Yes. <laughs> right. And get out the door. Get, we got to get out the door. Quit your dawdling. We got to get going. Like we're mm -hmm. always teaching our children to hurry as well. And if our voices aren't kind, that isn't a very good combination. So mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember there were many times trying to get out the door with the five of them. And I learned after a while, after making many mistakes, I would stop at the door and I would take a minute and say, okay, did we forget anything? How can you help me? Because I wanted them to, because often they would remember things that I wouldn't remember. And it gave me a moment just to be calm because otherwise I would leave in that speed that I was getting everybody ready. And then that would dictate the rest of my moment. Like if we're just going to dropping people off an event or whatever it was. And I thought, I need to take a deep breath <laughs> and just slow down a little bit. Yes. So how would you suggest that we block the noise of these voices out? We, we have to do it intentionally. It, it's just not going to happen on its own, Sandy. Mm. For example, just last night, I'm in a big room of about 100 women and we're having a Bible study. And at the end, there's a lot of chatter and it was time to pray. And I could find and it was and I lead the prayer and it was time for me to pray. And I couldn't concentrate because there were so many voices. Yes. And so what I did was, Sandy, I told our table of 12. I said, let's pick up our books. We're going into another room where mm. we're going to be quiet so we can hear each other's voices. Right. Right. But it has to be absolute radical, sometimes intentionality. Yes, it's true. It's just not going to happen on its own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that completely makes sense, I think. And that's where having other people, like you said, they, they listened to you and you everybody picked up and you went to another place and you made a choice. And I think that that's what that we need to do. We need to make that choice, what we're listening to, and then what flows from there, how we're speaking and our tone of voice and our facial expressions and 
Yeah, completely understand so that. We have that beautiful time that in that quiet of hearing each other's prayer requests, mm -hmm. just hearing each other pray. And it was just beautiful by the time we ended. But if we would have stayed in that room with all those voices, it would have all been lost. <laughs> yeah, it definitely would have been lost. Yeah. Uh, you talk a little bit about in the blog um, uh, about an impact from your own mother's voice. Um, can you talk about her impact? And you say, uh, one voice that I shall never forget. One that shaped my entire being was the sound of my mother's voice praying for me. My mom knew she couldn't control me, so she prayed for me. Through her bedroom walls, I heard the sound of my name wrapped in the flow of love and prayers for her beloved family. Oh, I read that again. I'm like, oh, it just got me. I'm like, oh, I love that. So maybe talk a little bit about the impact of your mom in that in your life. Well, I was a very rebellious teenager. Oh, my mother. And she could not control me. And her voice wasn't always kind to me either because, you know, she had a lot to work with with me. <laughs> and I remember many times coming in late at night and to come in late, I had to sneak by their bedroom door <laughs> quietly tiptoe. And many times as I was doing that, I could hear the sound of my mother. I'm going to cry even just. Oh, it got, it really got me, Heidi. When I reread this, I thought, ah, oh, you're your mom on your knee, on her knees. And it just, it really got me emotionally too. Yeah. And it, speaking, praying in her native tongue in German. And I remember thinking at the time, oh, mom, stop it. It embarrassed me, Sandy, that my mom was praying for me as I was trying to live life as a teenager. You know, right. as teenagers, we've got this, mom. Oh, I'm yeah. going to do life my way. Don't pray for me. It embarrassed me. Mm. And as I became a Christian at 30, age 32, I know it was my mother's prayers that mm. brought me there. I know that it was because she prayed for me faithfully. Wow. And as I became a Christian and then, you know, my voices weren't always so kind, I learned to pray for my children as well. Yeah. And I, and that taught me that, you know, we can't change everything. We can't control oh. everything, but we oh. can pray. And so that is something that I did right from the time I became a Christian. I began to pray for my children and I do it faithfully now. Beautiful. Because yes. of my sound of my mother praying for me. Oh, it's so beautiful, Heidi. I love the fact that you're so willing to share this because I think there's a lot of us out here right now that have had that rebellious heart because it's all, it's in us and we want to do our own thing. And having a mom come alongside of you when you don't want it <laughs> is, is really just a beautiful blessing. And it's, it's like to, she created like a legacy that is yeah. now flowing into your own kids and your grandchildren now. And you know, you talk about your grandchildren um, so lovingly and beautifully. And you mentioned not only do you say you love them, but you pray for them. So how important would you say it is that they know that you're praying for them? Oh. <laughs> Oh, it's so important to me. I, I just give you two instances to tell you how important it is for me. I remember looking after two of my grandchildren one time and they were fighting and I just didn't know. Each one said the other one was lying and I didn't know who was lying. So I brought them both together, held their hands and I said, I don't know who's lying, but I'm going to pray about it. <laughs> That's a teaching moment. And so I held, I brought them both into under my arms and I prayed for them. Both of them walked away to this day. I don't know who it was lying, but it was over. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And I, you know, and even just when my granddaughter was here, she's 15 years old. It's the first time she had been away on her own mm. and in a home where she literally grew up. She knows everything about my home, but right. she was afraid a little bit anxious about staying by herself in the bedroom down in the basement. Mm -hmm. And so what did I do? I wrapped my arms around her mm -hmm. and I loved her and I prayed with her. Oh, and so, <laughs> you know, I just want my children always to know that I praying, you know, if there's, if there's an, um, a need somewhere, I text, I'm praying for you. Let me know. I'm praying my children. I want my children and my grandchildren to know I am praying for them. And I do that all yeah. the time. Because there's yeah. nothing else I can do, Sandy. They all yeah. live far away. There's nothing yeah. I can do but pray. Absolutely. It's funny. Years ago, in a, a Bible study group, I was talking with a mom, and she made this comment that she just literally made it a constant thing so that it wasn't abnormal to her kids. So, and I thought, yeah, that's very similar to me in ways where we're just in the car and we pray. 
And um, so even the other day when I was driving with my youngest, um, my sister had been in this unfortunate accident recently and it was a miracle that they were okay. And so on the way to dance, uh, Katie, she just looked at me, she's like, mom, we gotta pray. And I, we were praying just, just together as we drove and we often do that, we'll just pray together. And my dad also modeled that because we used to do a lot of road trips in the station wagon and he would always commit our road trip to the Lord. So very early on, I learned, oh, I guess you pray all the time, even when we drive. So I'm sure you've made note of that in your own life, right? You just you just know, you just pray. It <laughs> doesn't matter where. We, one thing that we do in our home, Sandy, it doesn't matter who's in our home, our family, even if they bring non-Christian friends mm. before every meal, what we do in my home is we circle up. Mm. Circle in a big circle, we hold hands. I commit our time to the Lord and then I pray. Mm -hmm. And so children, everybody who comes into my home, children, grandchildren, friends, non-Christians, neighbors, whoever, right. we circle up and we pray. I love that. So, because I, I don't know how to do anything else without prayer, Sandy. No, it's true. It's so true. I think, and I think that circle up is, it's almost like you're just inviting people to join the circle and, and just unfold it for them and just let them see this is God at work. This is God at work, right? Yes. And again, our voices, right? Mm -hmm. Speaking life and hope into that circle and just people knowing that they're loved and that this is a place of love and safety and peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm sure they leave from your home with that sense of something's different here, you know, oh, and it carries with them. I hope so, Sandy. Yeah. <laughs> that's, we do. yeah. And that's what we pray, right? That's what we pray. Yes. Um, you know, you talk too about the power of prayer. Um, when did the power of prayer really come alive in your life? I know you touched on that a little bit when you said you became a Christian at the age of 32, but when do you feel like prayer really um, came alive for you? Oh, that is such a great question. <clears throat> I did pray out of a discipline uh, after I became a Christian, but it, it was out of discipline. Mm -hmm. It wasn't out of desperation. I learned Sandy to pray out of desperation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's where really where our knees hit the floor and it's a different prayer is when my first husband Dick died two weeks before mm -hmm. Christmas yeah. in 1994. Yeah. And that is where I sought God and I knew the only way to seek God was to pray and I began to pray desperately. It is mm -hmm. it, it, it was in my places of desperation where I knew I, I had to call out to a God who was greater than anything mm. that I could imagine. Yeah. And those, and that changed my prayer life. It wasn't out of discipline anymore. It was out of hunger and desperation. Mm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think um, I was just reading in a book that I was gifted. Um, I think it's called uh, through Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes, I think. Don't quote me on that. I'll have to look back. But um, one of the chapters is specifically on the Phoenician woman who was just so desperate for her daughter to be healed, who was possessed by a demon. And she was, it was, she was just crying out to the Lord, please, you know, listen here, have mercy. And those are valid prayers because we all find ourselves in those moments where we're just, we don't know what else to pray. We're just desperate for the Lord to help. And I, I prayed desperate prayers when my daughter was infertile for 14 years. I prayed desperate prayers when my son turned away from the Lord. It is when when we are in that place of suffering where we truly need God and prayer is just the only way that we can get through that. Yeah, it's the only way that we can actually push out those negative voices um, that can so easily cloud our mind and the comparison and uh, whatever the world is telling us that we need that we know we don't need but yet we're listening to that part more right oh well i love this last part here that you say um you ask this question and it's such beautiful food for thought how is your voice shaping the lives of your children is it creating an atmosphere of safety or love or fear or not meeting your expectations we don't always get it right but let your prayers and love cover a multitude of sins so how would you today, based on that, just that final little quote, how would you um, encourage a mom today who's just kind of on the cusp of, I feel like I'm not, my prayer life is being clouded or I'm listening to all these voices. And what would you say to encourage her today? 
just to start, Sandy, that's what I did when I became a Christian. Start it as a discipline, but know the power of our that our words have. I just did this post on Facebook just this week, which just got a lot of motion. It said, mm. a tongue that brings healing is a tree of life. It's mm. from Proverbs 15, 4. Mm. And we've had a lot of conversations on that, just to mm. know that our tongues either bring healing or they, they bring pain. Mm -hmm. And to know that the words that come out of our mouth shape our children's lives and to mm -hmm. know the power of that. When we, re for me to change anything, I need an understanding of something first mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to have the understanding of what our words can do. And just to, just to be, even before we open our mouth, just say, God, just help me, just help me, just give me wisdom, help me with my voice. And mm -hmm. I think once we ask God to change our voice over time, I believe that he will, once we know the impact that it has on other yes. people. Lives. Yeah. Yeah. That's really beautiful. And I, definitely was convicted again reading through this because um, even today, doesn't matter if I have kids that are older, you're still tempted to have a voice that may not be what you intended. And so what I keep learning is that I am so sorry. Will you forgive me so that they see that I acknowledge that I have made a mistake and I've sinned against them and against God ultimately and just seeking for forgiveness. And actually our pastor was talking about that just this past Sunday, that we forget that we need to not only ask forgiveness from the person that we've wronged, but we need to talk to God about that sin. We need to get right with God. Um, it's, it's, it's like a full circle thing. You can't just do it in one place. And it was really convicting. So I've been thinking about that a lot lately, um, how I can change that. So many things sandy we can't change on our own most things i can't change on my own i can't mm -hmm. so i just literally i know this sounds simplistic but it's the only way i do it i ask god to help me yeah i ask god to show me and i'm, I'm a visual person so i always say god show me mm -hmm. and when mm -hmm. i see the impact that my voice my words have had we realize mm -hmm. you know what our words are doing us so once we say, God, show me what my impact. And so if your child is walking away, you know, cowering and you know, your voice mm -hmm. has been harsh and cruel mm -hmm. and hurt their soul. And none of us want that. And then to just, you know, pray and ask God just to help you with that. Yeah. And I know that he, God gives us those desires when our desires line up with his desires. Absolutely. I love that because we don't want it to be complicated. It doesn't have to be. And I think we do overcomplicate it. Yes. And I think just that last reminder today that is so good is that you just start and it's simple. Just say, God, help me. And it doesn't have to be anything else. And then God will meet you. He will meet you personally in your time of need that will be just for you at that yeah. moment. And I believe that firmly. Absolutely. I do yeah. too, Sandy. Yeah. yeah. Well, Heidi, this has been a delight. Thank you so much for taking time to share your wisdom and to talk about your blog post, post on voices. And I look forward to connecting with you again. I trust your travels go well because I know you've got some engagements coming up and I'll continue to pray for you. And I'm so thankful for your friendship. So thanks for being here today. Thank you, Sandy. This has been rich. Talking about voices is just so mm -hmm. special to me yeah. and I know how important it is. So thank you for yes. tackling the topic that is so vital for motherhood yeah. and for children in our lives. So it thank really you, Sandy, is. for this great opportunity. Oh, it's my privilege and my blessing. I love it. Thank you so much, Heidi.